The University of California confirms Homeland Security Secretary Janet Napolitano as president. The University of California is the backbone of the state and a beacon for the nation and the world. Protesters, citing a poor record on immigrant rights and a lack of academic credentials, interrupt the hearing. A hefty penalty and fine proposed for PG&E for the 2010 San Bruno pipeline explosion. Two guilty verdicts in the Richmond gang rape trial bring some closure for the brutal crime that drew national attention. We, the jury, find George Zimmerman not guilty. And outrage over the acquittal of George Zimmerman for the shooting death of Trayvon Martin sparks protests in the Bay Area. A one-on-one -on -one conversation about its impact with a prominent civil rights attorney. Coming up next. Good evening. I'm Twee Vu. Welcome to This Week in Northern California. Joining me tonight for a look at some of this week's news are Amy Allison with the San Francisco Department on the Status of Women and Freelance Journalist, Jackson Vanderbecken, San Francisco Chronicle reporter, and Anna Tintakalis, education reporter for KQED News. It's official. This week, UC Regents confirmed former Homeland Security Secretary Janet Napolitano as the 20th president of the University of California. I have not spent a career in academia, but that said, I have spent 20 years in public service advocating for it. But before the confirmation vote, the meeting was disrupted by immigration rights advocates. Anna, there is a uh, tremendous excitement, but also concern, as we saw in the shots of the protests just now, about this appointment. Why was Napolitano chosen, and what does she bring to the job? Well, obviously, she's quite a notable figure. Everyone knows her as the face of the nation's immigration policy. What she brings with her is that political clout. Um, she's known as being a very firm decision maker, able to handle very complex organizations, also able to reach across the aisle and um, bring people together and so obviously the UC is having some big political problems not only with uh, its budget but also just its political reputation and so uh, the regents and UC officials believe she will be able to right the ship politically so to speak and get the UC back on this kind of um, pedestal of, of public education in California. So she's been brought in as sort of the political figurehead, if you will, but there are a number of faculty members who have expressed the concern that this doesn't feel right. She comes from so far outside of academia, and they fear the politicization of the office of president. Right. I mean, it, it is of note that she has no academic background whatsoever other than her father, many people don't know this, uh, was the dean um, of the medical school at, in New Mexico, at the University of New Mexico. But she, you know, she has no academic experience. That doesn't mean um, people say that she is less qualified. I mean, the, the position is very political at this point. And um, some critics say, well, you know, you're looking for a politician, not an educator, and that's the wrong way to go in, in the it for California. But um, needless to say, experts say at this point, um, we need someone who can handle this 10 campus system and be an advocate for higher public, public education in California, because right now there's a void. There's no cheerleader for this area of education. And she can go to bat in Sacramento, in Washington, and really make the case. You know, we were both at the UC Regents meeting uh, yesterday. We, we saw each other. We saw the protesters. We saw the arrests. And there were a number of undocumented immigrants who came um, up in, to the microphone and spoke very publicly and very poignantly at times about uh, the fear and their families feel about being deported. 
What does Napolitano need to do to ease those concerns and to win their support? Well, she's going to have to do a lot to win their trust. I mean, um, we talked about some of the good parts, you know, that she brings to the position. One thing that um, many undocumented students uh, feel like this is an attack on their heritage, on their people. Um, uh, when at the public comment period, you heard you heard of families being torn apart, and they can't. They can't seem to um, bridge that divide, that trust divide of trusting a leader who has cracked down on their families. And I think that's where you get a lot of the angst. And so she publicly said, you know, one of the things, one of the best things she feels she brings to California is her ears, that she'll be able to listen to students and really try to connect with them. She said documented or undocumented, the UC is for everyone and that she, in this capacity, she's in the in the business of education, and that she essentially is going to leave her legacy of um, you know immigration policy, deportations behind her um, once she does take the reins in in September. It's going to be tough for her to leave that legacy behind uh, in the wake of the defeat of the California Dream Act that had so much uh, to say about the way that uh, California deals with immigrant students, and particularly undocumented. Currently, undocumented students don't have a lot of options in terms of financial aid, mm -hmm. in terms of being able to make the case uh, to stay and get a UC education. Having Napolitano at the head of the UC system doesn't ease those fears in a concrete way. So she'd have to address that uh, head on. I yeah, I mean, there are some experts that say maybe she can help kind of help the UC think outside of the box when it comes to immigration policies and how that might better impact students. Because you're right, at this point, uh, they really have no other option. I mean, if they don't have money to go to college, they, they can't. They legally can't go to college because of their, you know, their documentation status. There was um, a change in terms of the federal laws that allowed them to apply for a waiver to allow them to stay and finish mm -hmm. their higher education. But some, some were granted, some aren't. So it's still uh, you know, a difficult situation for these students. And just real quickly, how much money will she make? It's quite a bump up from her roughly $200,000 a year as a Homeland Security it's chief. It's a huge bump up. At, uh, as, at DHS, she was making two hundred. dollars you know, thousand. Um, she'll be making more than half a million dollars. Uh, I believe it's five hundred and seventy-five hundred thousand dollars. So, um, you know, sh people say she's making slightly less than Mark Udoff, her predecessor, which um, topped at six hundred thousand. I think it's ten percent less. Um, and I think you know, some people say that might go over better with students, but it's still a lot of money, and, yeah. and that you know, a lot of students hissed and and uh, you know. Yeah. basically said injustice when they heard of her sal uh, her salary package. And she did address that yesterday. She took a slightly lower salary by choice because she wants to be sensitive to the UC system's budget troubles. She does start roughly around end of September. So right. we'll see how it all shakes out. Thank you so much. Thank you. The PUC has come down hard on PG&E with a double blow, a penalty to be spent on pipeline safety improvements, and a fine to the state. This stems from the 2010 San Bruno explosion that killed eight people and destroyed 38 homes. Now, Jackson, the PUC, didn't they already impose a $2.25 billion fine about two months ago? So why was this revised? Well, this is a point where they're making a recommendation. It's finally between this point now, it goes to administrative law judges and ultimately the commission itself to make the final decision. So they recommended a $2.25 billion penalty, but it didn't include a fine. And what happened was is there was dissent within the legal staff that said that basically they were not holding their standards as a public regulatory agency by not imposing a fine. And however, there was a dissent within the organization and ultimately what happened was is that they withdrew the $2.25 billion, which was all to go to a safety improvements and filed a new motion that mixes it with the $300 million fine along with the balance of $1.95 billion towards safety improvements. So the $300 million fine will actually go into state coffers as opposed to additional safety improvements. That's right. And they felt that uh, the, the attorneys who advocated for this basically felt that you can't call it a penalty unless you include a fine. The other, the improvements themselves, pg &E arguably would have to have done that anyway. So to call that a penalty or a fine or something akin to that, they felt that you had to at least include a fine amount that goes into the state 
uh, budget uh, offset, you know, so to speak, and not take away money from the state. Jackson, I heard there was some um, issues around the attorneys representing um, PG&E, PEC. Could you help iron that out for me? Because how, well, how does that play into the A story? lot of this happened behind closed doors. But basically what happened was is that there was a head of safety who's uh, come into the PUC, and he comes from a military background, and he basically wanted all the money to go to safety improvements. And he felt that every dollar that was collected as part of this agreement to penalize pg e was to, for the San Bruno pipeline explosion, should go towards improving their system. Mm -hmm. However, other people say that, and some people within the legal staff argued that, well, you, you know, that Im what are those improvements? Are they related to San Bruno or are they basically kitchen sink stuff that they were just throwing in a bunch of other costs and counting it as a penalty so then essentially they would not neither pay a fine or improve the system to the best extent possible because they were counting stuff that didn't directly relate to San Bruno. So, so with, this, with this latest two-pronged penalty, if you will, um, what's been the reaction from San Bruno residents, utility reform advocates, and from PG&E? Well, PG&E thinks it's excessive. They thought the original, they've always said that this is excessive. And I think they've gotten better reviews from San Bruno. The city of San Bruno is a party to this. So they have an interest here, and they originally thought that the $2.25 billion all going towards improvements, they want even more money on top of that. They want not, th there's a this argument that there's only so much they can get out of PG&E. But San Bruno believes that they should pay all $2.25 in improvements plus an additional fine as well. So, you know, but the PUC believes that they basically studied the problem. They had an analyst look at it and they basically said $2.25 billion is the most that this company could safely absorb without going belly up. And so that's sort of the, that's the cap. And then how you distribute it is the issue. Um, on a related issue, Congresswoman Jackie Speer of San Mateo is now calling for a federal investigation into the state PUC and its handling of safety concerns surrounding PG&E. What exactly is she demanding? Well, the PUC is, uh, to say the least, it's, it's, it, it has its critics. And a lot of people believe that the PUC is basically kind of got this sort of you know, hand in glove relationship with the utilities they regulate. There's, you know, the lead counsel for the agency had formerly worked at PG&E as a lawyer. So there's a lot of people who seem to think that there's just a little too cozy relationship. But so, there are also some conflicting roles on there because then on the one hand it sets rates, but on the other hand it's supposed to, uh, supposed to also oversee safety issues. Right, and safety is cost and rates, keeping rates low and arguably there's conflicting um, priorities, so we say. Safety costs raise rates. And if you're under a lot of pressure, as the PUC always is, to keep rates low because of utility advocates and poor people can't afford it, then they're pitting, they're, they're basically at war with themselves. Safety versus keeping rates low. And that's why some people believe that there should be a separate agency that does the regulatory, whether it's the attorney general or some other agency that would do it. Okay, and this still needs to be approved by the full five-member uh, PUC, and that is supposed to happen sometime in the fall, correct? Right. All right, Jackson, thank you. Two men accused in the gang rape of a teenage girl outside a Richmond High School homecoming dance were convicted Thursday. They were both found guilty of the brutal attack that shocked the Bay Area four years ago. Amy Allison, you have followed this story closely. Um, very brutal attack. What's been the reaction in the community? Do they feel justice has been served? I think so. Um, had an opportunity to uh, speak with Tony Thurman, who was uh, newly elected to the school board in Richmond in 2009 and was appointed head of the safety committee for the district, Richmond uh, Unified School District. Uh, he uh, echoed the sentiment of a lot of uh, Richmond residents. They hope that this is bringing closure to the family, to the victims, and uh, even though this egregious attack happened, it really forced Richmond to look at the issue of sexual violence and it forced the school district to implement some best practice measures and they haven't seen any attack close to that since. So I think the community is realizing justice has served. And just to give you a sense, each one of those defendants got a, uh, a sentence of 33 years to life. So maximum uh, sentence uh, for this egregious crime. And I want to make it clear that you're here in your capacity as um, an independent journalist. You're not here speaking on behalf of the San Francisco Department of Women's Development. And in fact, you have a column coming out about this very case um, in the Huffington Post tomorrow. 
since this case happened, uh, have any safety improvements taken place? Better lighting, better security? Well, let's remember that uh, what happened in 2009 was that a sophomore, a girl, uh, left the homecoming dance around 9 o'clock, was supposed to call her dad for a ride home, was called into a dark part of the campus uh, that wasn't uh, uh, surrounded by chain link fence and it wasn't well lit and there's where they were drinking and uh, she was accosted and um, gang raped. In this situation, the school district had already had a request to purchase and upgrade the lighting and the security and to, uh, and to uh, put fencing so that non-students didn't have, didn't have easy access to campus. Those things, it took this crime for the assembly member representing the district to be able to secure the money in order to make those improvements. So those exist now at Richmond High. Uh, but, but it took something like this. It took something for more that to like happen. this. So we can look at uh, the actual physical safety of a, of a school campus as a huge lesson learned and I hope every school district across California and the nation are really looking at the safety of their physical campus as uh, the first way to prevent this kind of crime. Uh, the second is that in 2009, the district secured funds to hire a community agency called Community Violence uh, Services to run trainings for middle and high school students in the city of Richmond, as well as for staff and administration. All about, you know, part, part of the reason this was such a, a shocking crime is that she was brutally attacked for two hours, surrounded by up to 20 bystanders, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. it took uh, a, a young man who uh, the bystanders called over to participate in the gang rape to actually call 911. So uh, the issue of bystanders, this, they uh, have trainings in the schools, as well as uh, the issue of sexual violence, how to pre prevent it, and uh, for young men taking responsibility for their own actions. You know, this is one in a series of cases of violence against um, female high school students that have drawn national attention. There was also uh, the case of Audrey Pot in Saratoga, a uh, high school student sexually assaulted off campus at a sleepover, then later cyberbullied, uh, and then she later committed suicide. There was also the case in uh, Steubenville, Ohio, as well, a high school girl sexually assaulted by her peers. What does all this say about how young women are perceived, and what can we do to go about correcting um, what young men think they, they can do and how they can mm. treat women? Well, it's no doubt about the fact that uh, uh, through the media, lots of negative images about sex and about power and about men and about women. Our, uh, young people are absorbing that um, and it's having a very negative effect. Uh, sexual violence and sexual crimes among the, the age group of high school is, is on the rise. So uh, not only school districts like Richmond, but the community is recognizing more and more they have a responsibility to talk about the dangers of sexual violence and the cycle of violence. And um, It's interesting because it's sexual violence and rape and it's also community violence that uh, people need to talk openly about how to break that cycle and address. And I think uh, the more that uh, it's talked about and the more preventative measures, because uh, truth be told, I, I think this case makes us all recognize we all have young women in our, in our lives. We want to make sure that they're safe and we want the young men uh, that we know to uh, not, not only not uh, participate, but to stop acts of violence. And so that's what we have to invest in. All right, well, let's hope this case leads to some greater good. I want to point out that Marcellus Peter and Jose Montano, the two men who were uh, convicted, uh, were found guilty of numerous felony charges. They're now in their 20s. They will be sentenced August 15th, but two more men uh, still need to go through the trial process. Thank you very much, Amy. Well, the acquittal of George Zimmerman in the shooting death of Trayvon Martin has sparked shock and outrage across the country. Here in California, there have been protests throughout the week, with some in Oakland turning violent. Earlier today, I spoke with Eva Patterson, president of the Equal Justice Society, about the impact of the verdict and the response. President Obama spoke about it this morning. I think it's important to recognize that um, the African-American community is looking at this issue through uh, a set of experiences and a, and a history that, uh, that doesn't go away. Eva Patterson, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. 
First, I'd like to ask you about uh, President Obama's surprise news conference today, speaking about Trayvon Martin. Did he hit the right tone and all the right points, or was it too little too late? I was thrilled with his comments because I thought it was very important for a black man of his stature to talk about the fact that what happened to Trayvon Martin has happened to him. Black people, we often get followed around in stores, we're often put in the bad part of restaurants, we can't get cabs. And I think uh, Trayvon Martin's situation was emblematic of how we're not always viewed as full human beings. So for the most powerful man on the planet to get up and say, this happened to me, I think may have helped explain to certain people what happened with Trayvon Martin. The only thing I was a little disappointed about, and I was 99 percent delighted, was his hedging on whether or not the Department of Justice could file criminal charges against Zimmerman. There's the Matthew Shepard, James Byrd Hate Crimes Act that can be invoked when a state court process Execution does not really deal with people's civil rights. He seemed to be downplaying the ability of the Department of Justice to get involved. Maybe that's because they've already determined they're not going to file charges and he didn't want to get our hopes up. But aside from that, I thought it was a home run. And if charges, if federal charges are not filed, mm -hmm. Um, what does that say about our criminal justice system? Well, I'm a civil rights lawyer, and I think criminal charges probably should be filed. But if they're not, it means that a state like Florida, and remember, they took black people off the rolls in 2000, which led to the uh, stolen election. Um, they've done all kinds of horrible things, changing voting laws to make it more difficult for people, black people to vote in 2012. If they get away with this, uh, a, a, a decision that many people feel was a great injustice, it just makes I was going to say black people, but I think it's all people of goodwill, just feel very disappointed in the criminal justice system. Trayvon Martin should not be dead. George Zimmerman should have stayed in his car. George Zimmerman is free and has a gun. There's another woman in Florida named Marissa Alexander who fired a shot into the air because her husband was abusing her. She was nailed um, and has, has been given 20 years in jail. George Zimmerman walks free for the same stand your ground type situation. So it just reinforces the notion that black people do not really get justice in this system. Are you saying then that, that, that racial bias is inherent in the racial justice system, in the criminal justice system? My organization, the Equal Justice Society, has done a lot of work on racial bias. We all have it. We all have unexamined biases and stereotypes. There's a horrible case called McCleskey versus Kemp, which challenged the racial bias in the imposition of the death penalty. If you killed a white person, your chances of getting the death penalty were something like 16 times more than if you killed a black person. Justice Powell, who said, uh, who basically let Mr. McCleskey die, said there's bias in every aspect of the criminal justice system, where do we start? It's well known, for example, let's say a white kid is riding around joyriding. Um, he may be sent home after the police stop him. A black kid will more than likely be sent to juvie. Black kids are often charged as adults. White kids are charged as juveniles. You see the over-incarceration of people of color. Um, so yes, I believe there is racial bias, not just in the criminal justice system, but in every aspect of society. You can't have a system that had slavery, that has had biases against Asian American immigrants and Latinos. You can't have a system that's allowed that to happen without seeing bias reflected in all aspects of our society. What I found interesting in the Zimmerman trial is that they did not talk about racial profiling. They did not use the stand your ground law. Um, what they really talked about was that George Zimmerman had reason to fear for his life because there had been a number of crimes committed by African Americans in the area and therefore when he saw Trayvon Martin he had good reason to fear for his life. What is the message inherent in that? It's so racially biased as to be laughable. Am I to look at every kind of strange white man and think he's going to have a gun and mow down six-year-olds or mow down people in a the theater just because there have been some deranged white men who do that? Of course not. Yet society feels more comfortable making that generalization about black men. Trayvon Martin had Skittles and iced tea. He was walking to his father's home. George Zimmerman was told to stay in his car. He had various notions about what a young black man was doing in his neighborhood. I think despite the fact that the um, prosecution and the judge did not allow, I think the judge did not allow racial bias to be raised, the 
defense played to racial biases. They showed that picture of Trayvon Martin bare-chested. They talked about the fact that there had been young black men uh, burglarizing homes. And I, there's something in social science called priming people. Mm -hmm. And when you talk in these ways about gays and lesbians, Latinos, Asian Americans, blacks, it primes negative reactions. So the defense primed the jury to think, well, George Zimmerman saw this black man. He was totally within his rights to think this black man was going to rob somebody in that complex. He was walking home with Skittles. So, so the criminal justice system has racial bias inherent in it, according to what you're saying. Where do we go from here? How do we move this forward and rectify that? My organization convened a mind science conference in Chicago in April, and we had leading social scientists there, including a UCLA professor named Philip Goff, who's been working with police departments around the country to help them identify their biases. You have this shooter bias where if a black man holds up a, a wallet, it's seen as a gun, and he's mowed down. If a white man holds up a gun, people, excuse me, a wallet, they think it's a wallet, and he walks away. So he's been trying to train police in how to examine and their biases. There also are uh, social scientists around the country working on debiasing. It used to be if you could show people who had biases against black people a picture of Colin Powell and of Tiger Woods, their biases would go down for 72 hours and then they come back. Huh. There's new cutting edge research that seems to be able to get the biases down for several months. We'll be working with the social scientists and hopefully can present this information broadly in society. We all have biases. You and I have biases. It's the way of the world, but we want to make sure that these biases don't result in a young boy, child, walking to his dad's house, getting misidentified as a potential criminal, shot and killed, and the man who murdered him walks free with his gun, whereas a black woman who shoots in the air is in jail for 20 years. That's just wrong. Oh, very interesting. Certainly a tragic case, but it has sparked a national conversation and a conversation that we, we really do need to have. Absolutely. Eva and, Patterson. And personally with each other. I think of, um, yes. President Obama was right. It shouldn't be politicians, but you and I should have the conversation, have the conversation with friends. As my friend Angela Blackwell said, it's going to be uncomfortable, but we've got to talk about it honestly. All right, and see where it goes from there. Eva Patterson with the Equal Justice Society. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And that is all for our show for tonight. I want to thank our guests for joining me. And you can visit kqed.org slash this week for archives of our show. And a quick program note, please tune in next Friday at 7.30 p.m. for a special presentation of Life After War. It's an in-depth look at some of the challenges veterans face returning home to California. It's a co-production of KQED and the Center for Investigative Reporting, hosted by Scott Schaefer. We hope you'll tune in. I'm Tui Vu. Have a good night.